All right, we'd like to welcome you out this evening. And we're going to talk a little bit about proving a person's identity on family search. I'm sure none of you have ever run across situations in family search where there's been people that uh, were misidentified. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to maybe avoid that situation today because we all run into it in our own research and your patrons are going to run into it. And for those that don't have much experience, it's really important to understand the concept we're talking about tonight. You know, it's one of those big challenges. You don't want to fall down a rabbit hole when you're researching and start putting together a family that doesn't really belong to you as if it is part of your family. And so we'll try to give you some ideas of what to do and show you examples of, of uh, bad practices and then maybe some ideas on how to put things together the right way. Okay, the basic problem is that names for people you, you find will often be the right names, but the question will be, are they really the right people? Because unfortunately, there's more than one person on earth with the same name as the person you're looking for when you're doing research. And sometimes there's many people with the same name. I was just doing that with a family, Wilson family in Philadelphia. I never realized how many Wilsons are in Philadelphia. And I wanted like a William Wilson, and there were like a million William Wilsons. And so it can really be a challenge sometimes. Other times you're working with an odd name. There's only one person with that name, but not very often. So what we're really looking at is we want to identify people based on their genealogical identity. And that's a concept you may have never heard of before. It comes from the Board of Certification of Genealogists, from the genealogy standards that they've developed. And they say that genealogical identity are the characteristics and contexts distinguishing one person from all other people throughout history. In other words, as you go researching John Jones, you're trying to identify that one John Jones who is the guy that's in your family, who's married to so-and-so and has these children, whose parents were so-and-so. And there's only one of them, and you want to be able to find that person. The trouble is you may have to ferret him out from amongst many other John Jones, who oftentimes have some of the same characteristics but there's only going to be one that's your guy. That's the idea behind genealogical identity is finding that one person that really is the one you're looking for. And the real bottom line is we all are unique. We want to identify the unique individual that's our ancestor using all the evidence we can, and we can be like Sherlock Holmes here and uh, do some really good digging around as we work and hopefully come up with the guy that we want. Now, we're gonna use two types of things to help us uh, pursue this genealogical identity. And that's sources. And we're gonna think about sources maybe in a little different way than we're used to. We'll talk about that in a second. And then relational factors between sources and relationships, we should be able to develop a, a unique identity for the person that we're working on. Now, when we're looking at those sources, I want you to think about them in a little bit different way. Think about how the sources can help us identify some of those things that we often kind of just glance over and don't really pay a lot of attention to, like occupations, because an occupation can be a big help in identifying somebody, especially when you get a whole bunch of people with the same name. If the guy you're looking for happens to be a plasterer, a person that plasters walls, well, that gives you a chance to use that as a way to separate him from the other people. 
residence locations you know we use a lot of censuses a lot of times we don't pay real close attention to the residence issue and that can make a big difference it also comes in handy when you're looking at uh, city directories and seeing who lives where and then over time who's lived in that particular address and then, of course, we have the birth and death information, the dates and the places. You're going to want to really pay close attention to that. It really becomes handy when you've got maybe two John Joneses and one born in 1831 and the other one in 1834. Which one is this? And those dates and places can help you with that. Middle names are another thing. You're going to want to go with as much variation on people as you can. Knowing that middle names are a tricky issue. The same thing with nicknames. Uh, sometimes sources will use the person's nickname. Sometimes they won't. Censuses are notorious. You can have four different censuses and have four different middle names. You might have a written out middle name and three different initials, things like that. Is That can be tricky, but sometimes those middle names make all the difference in identifying a person. Land ownership, which person owned which land? When you're working in an area where you're trying to identify your ancestor, if you can uh, sometimes use that land ownership to help you separate him from the other people that had the same name, military service. Because some people joined the military and others didn't, this can help you in separating the various people with the same name once you figure out whether your person joined the military or not, served in the military or not. And then even handwriting, that's one of the things we often skip over. Many of our sources, some not many, but some of our sources will come with the person's own name, handwritten. And the difference between whether the person had to put an X in there for their name because they were illiterate or they're able to sign their name can often help you identify which person is yours is you're separating out the various people with the same name. So when you're looking at sources for one of these people that you're having trouble with, when you're trying to identify them, these are the kind of things you might want to look at within the sources that go beyond just the basic birth and death and marriage dates and places because they sometimes can help make a big difference. Now, the other side of the coin are relationships. And you most definitely want to pay close attention to those as you're working with people. Who do the sources show as parents or siblings or extended family members? Sometimes they're named as a grandchild to somebody. Or you may give their grandchildren in a source. Then, you know, the spouses. What were the names of their spouses or spouse? And then children or lack thereof. You know, if you're looking for somebody that uh, you felt never had children and you find somebody that might be them, but the person has three children listed, that might be a clue that it isn't your person. It also might mean that you need to do some more research because your person might have actually had some kids. And then the rest of the fan club. Fan club means the family, uh, and neighbors, all those people that associates, all the people, family associates and neighbors that are related to this person. Often who they associate with, who they're, they're uh, living near, and things like that will help you to separate out the people so that you can find the one that's really yours. So these are the kind of things you want to look at when you're running into a problem. Now, you know, if you don't have a problem, if the person's very easy to identify, you just go ahead and, you know, you put them into tree and you're done. But in some cases, you have to go to this extreme to come out with 
who really is that person that we're looking for out of all these possibilities. So what we're wanting to do is avoid the slippery step and falling on our rear like this guy's doing. And, you know, a lot of people, especially beginners, get into tree and they'll mix these unrelated people up or just pick somebody out of the blue because the name's the same and that sort of thing. And what they're doing is creating some real problems. And what we want to do is try to help our ourselves or our patrons that we work with not fall into these slippery s slopes. So. Here's some a couple of examples. I'll go through some simple examples. I'm working on the John Larrabee family. And these are all things that I found in my tree that people had done. Okay, so it's not like I'm making up something. I'm actually picking out a situation. So somebody been working on John Larrabee and, and Mary Ingersoll. These are my ancestors from the 1700s in Maine. And they have 12 identified children. And so obviously somebody said, let's go look in records and see if we can find any more, if there's somebody missing. And so they went over into search records and somebody found this record and attached Benjamin Scott Larrabee to this family because, gee, it sounds pretty good at first glance. Benjamin Scott Larrabee, his father's John. Well, the father in this family is John Larrabee. And the guy died in 1838, and that appears to be reasonable, maybe, for some of these kids, maybe an older child in the family, or a younger child in the family that might have lived a little bit longer. We've got the Deborah in this family lived all the way to 1828, lived to be 100 years old. So it's, it was reasonable. Now, what do you do in a situation like this? You look at the actual record if it's available, which it is. And so when you look at the actual record, you find out that it came from the a transcription of the town records for uh, Scarsboro. And it's for the family of a John Larrabee and a Seneth, his wife. Well, that right there tells you we got a problem because Mary Edna Ingersoll is the wife of John of our John Larrabee. And this Benjamin Scott Larrabee, his birth is actually in this record. It was in 1835. I really don't think that Mary Ingersoll would have had a child in 1835. This is obviously a different family. Seneth and John Larrabee are not the same couple. And so this was a person that we had to remove out of the family. But it's a very, very common problem where people jump on same name and same place. So it's got to be the same person. You know, realize, see, there's a lot of Larrabees in Scarsboro. They're there for generations. In fact, in this case, probably several generations later and so there's probably been four or five generations of Larrabees there could easily be 20 different John Larrabees in that town so you have to look a little deeper you can't just jump at the you know simple things like this and say well based on a name and the town this has got to be the right family there's got to be more to it than that okay Another situation, I have my Carter family is in New Hampshire in very early United States days. As you can see, he was born in 1647, first generation in America. And the mom's name, the wife, and in, the, in this case, the mother of the children is not known. People are always wanting to put a name to her because they have got to have a name. Unfortunately, we don't know her name. And somebody came along and attached William Catter into this family, mainly because his father's name is Richard. And it gives us a mother's name of Francis. And so they were very happy to put this William in here, who supposedly was christened in 1674. 
and that would fit right in here between 1673 and 1675. They just missed one minor little detail, and that's the fact that the William Carter or Catter that they added into this family was born in England. And this is a family that lived and died in New Hampshire. But that little detail just kind of skipped them because, well, the name and the time period was right. And you'd say, nobody could be so silly as to do that. Well, they did. This was actually in the family. And I had to remove this William from the family because he's just not from our family. Okay, and then this one's probably my favorite. James Giles Monell is my ancestor. I think probably fifth or sixth great grandfather. Okay. And I went into tree one day and he's now in a family. Well, let's look at this family. The father Francisco, it says, is born in France and they don't know where he died. The mother Francesca supposedly is born in France. And we don't know when she died. And they married in this particular town in Rennes in France in 1688, which would fit fine for James. Then it starts to have some problems. It starts to unravel when you get down to the children in that James, my ancestor, was born in Ireland. And that's from family records. And died in the state of New York. And his sis, supposed sister, Maria, was born in Lima, Peru. And this family is probably a, one of the best examples of a totally scrambled bunch of people. I know what's going on. I can tell you just from looking at it, Monel's a very uncommon name. And somebody found this Francisco Monel married at the right time period, didn't matter where, just at the right time period to be the parent of James Monell, and they said, let's go with it. And that's what they did. And this is the kind of thing we've got to teach our patrons not to do, to go a little deeper, because this is a classic messed up family. Francisco and Francesca apparently go together in France, they probably have a whole family of their own. But James and Maria have nothing to do with this. And James and Maria have nothing to do with each other, I'm sure. Other than the fact that Mono is in both of their names. Okay. And then the other one is one that I actually went over to Ancestry to show you an example of it. Because I wanted to show you the extensiveness of this. Some classic slippery slopes have been there for a long time. And they're, they continue because once something is posted incorrectly somewhere online, it lives forever. And this is a great example of it. You can see in family search, you only see it once because we only have one record for each person. You don't understand the extensiveness of the problem. But when you go over to Ancestry, where everybody's got their own tree, we find that Robert Pogue is found in over 5,000 different trees at Ancestry with the wife, Elizabeth Preston. Well, there's one little problem. Elizabeth Preston isn't his wife. It's an Elizabeth um, Rennick. And Elizabeth Preston comes from a book that a guy wrote on the Pogue family where he misidentified the wife of Robert Pogue. And people continue to refer to the book, even though there's no sourcing. And just say, based on the book, it's Elizabeth Preston. And so you're going to run into some of those kind of things out there on family search. And you just have to be aware of it. Some of these slippery slopes, slopes were already made. And sometimes you have to actually undo them when we find them. We don't have to make them because somebody else has done it for us. 
Okay, so what can we do? What's a, what's a plan? Let's talk about a game plan for a couple of minutes. You know, not all of our ancestors are easy to identify. For the ones that aren't easy to identify, we need to develop a system. If they're easy to identify, we just go ahead and we identify them and we move on. But when they're hard to identify, then we're going to have to come up with some kind of a, a solution to how to deal with this. And what we may discover is what we're going to do is try to gather all the records necessary to, to solve our problem, understanding that as we gather these records, they won't always agree, even if they're the right records for the right person. That's the sad part about genealogy. Records have their own issues. Sometimes they were just clerical mistakes. Sometimes people misstated things deliberately. Sometimes who knows why, but it's wrong. So ultimately, you know, no one record will maybe even answer our question. We're gonna have to take the combination of all of our records and if they don't agree enough, we may even have to then do some inferencing, which is not something we really wanna do, but occasionally we just have to infer our ancestors identity because there's just simply no one record or group of records that will put together this person with an absoluteness. But hopefully we can get to that point with good research, but it doesn't always happen. So just be aware of that. Okay, here's what I would recommend. One is create a plan when you run into a person that's a problem, because what you're gonna do is you're not going to go and when you're having trouble identifying a person, go in and start attaching everything you find that might be for this person into tree, because that's gonna cause a mess. You're gonna be creating a real confusion for everybody. So what you're probably gonna to wanna to do is you're going to wanna create a plan of research and do some note taking one way or another. And we'll talk about that until you're satisfied with what you need to put into tree. Once you've satisfied yourself that you found your person, then the sources that really go with that person need to go into tree and the connections and the people, the relationships that go with this person need to be connected. So you need to think out to yourself, what are you really trying to prove? You're looking at John Jones. Are you trying to figure out who his wife is or who his children are because you know his wife? Or is it you're trying to figure out who his parents are? Or, you know, what, what exactly is it you're looking for? And try to, if you have to, write it down and stick to what it is you really look you're really looking for till you figure it out okay then you want to figure out what do you already know hopefully what you already know is accurate what sources do you already have on this person and then go back and review them look for missed facts remember the things we were talking about earlier is there an occupation named in this fact in this source that maybe you've never paid attention to or the address they lived at or this military record that he had on him okay list the places you plan to search if you know enough in research that you've got some ideas well i want to look at this, this census and that census i want to look for a death certificate i want to look for a newspaper article you know list the sources you might want to try to find and then keep a record of what you found. Now, this is a research log. You might want to go that route, or there's other things you can do. You can track what you're gathering on a spreadsheet or in a word processor, or sometimes there's even programs that have been written to help you keep track of your research. I don't use any of those. I do mine's more along the lines of what we have here. Or maybe you have a uh, genealogy software program that's your own database. Well, you can make changes in your own database and then delete them later if you want. 
And that way, nobody else is being led astray. But really keep a good record of what you found new and where you found it. If you get a birth date, where did you find that birth date? Because those will be the things that will really help you when it's time to start, you know, putting this in the tree with the right sources and that sort of thing. So keep a record as you go and you'll find out it will save you a lot of time. Pay attention to chronology. I'm not real heavy on timelines. This is one of my ancestors, John Nail, and it was really helpful to create a timeline on him as we tried to put this family together because of the simple thing that he went and died a few months before the 1850 census, so he's not found on a census with his own children. Fortunately, his wife was still alive in 1850, and some of the kids weren't married yet, and so they were found together in a family, but he wasn't there. And so it's really nice, though, to have this timeline because we could start piecing together possible children knowing the last name of Nail, which was unusual, and finding them in places where the known children were, they were they fit in and then we eventually found cross-reference sources that fit them into the family where it named the mom or the dad or siblings or things like that so we know that this family is really a family of people that go together and dna has verified it for almost all the children all the children that left descendants have shared dna with me and so it's really cool. This is a family where DNA helped us a lot to verify that our research was good. But the main thing here is use a chronology like this to help you piece together what you've got. And you can see if there's inconsistencies or problems. And then work on placing people in the correct family. As you run across the ref references, the sources that have family relationships in them, you know, cross references. These are these the right family members for the person I'm looking for. You might actually be able to build several different families based on these sources and the people that are found in these sources. And this will help you place records with the correct family for each person, not just the one that you're trying to find. But in doing that, it helps you to identify the people you don't want to count. And who knows, in the end, if they're all from the same area, they may be related and you may be doing some pre-research for the cousins, aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews too. Utilize maps. A lot of times maps can help you in finding things. This is an example of a patent where uh, Beverly was given this, Mr. Beverly was given this land in Virginia, and my Givens family was given grants of land in there. The Pogue family that we talked about earlier, they were given grants of land in there. The Cathy family has grants of land in there. The Robinson family has grants of land in there. These are all my ancestral lines, and they're all found in different parts of that patent. And they tend to cluster together. The Robertsons that are related to each other are all in one section there. The Pogues that are related together are all in one section. The Givens that are related together are all in one section. And so you can find oftentimes maps can help you unravel a problem. So don't disregard maps. Okay. So let's look at three examples and show you a little bit about what, you know, I've done with some real situations. So one is I was doing some research on a John A. Givens. And I want, ultimately my question is, did he serve in the Civil War? All I knew about him to begin with was what you see there from tree. I had a birth date and place, Lincoln County, Kentucky, born in 1834, died in 1881, don't even know where, no spouse. I had parents, but I left those off on this. 
one of his sources was find a grave. And based on what's on that gravestone, and I can see it better at find a grave and blow it up and actually read it, it gave the death date, which agreed with what's in family search, that 1881 date, and then gave his age in years, months, and days, which calculated out to the 11th of April, but 1830, not 1834, is found in family search. And so, you know, at first glance, you would think that family search is more likely to be in error. And this is more likely to be correct. It matches with the age, you know, the birth date based on the age on the stone, which doesn't necessarily have to be correct. But at least it's in agreement with what else is on the stone. So that's part of the question is when was he born? And so we start by looking at censuses. And uh, as one knows, this census stone, I mean, is this gravestone really the John A. Givens that I'm working with? Well, he's buried in Johnson County, Missouri. I went to the censuses in Missouri and found. John A. Givens on 1850, 60, 70, well, not on 70, you couldn't find him there for some reason, and 1880, so 50, 60, and 80, all in Jackson Township, Johnson County. That's confusing. Jackson Township's just a little village in, in uh, Johnson County that he lived in, but those are all locations in that Johnson County where this John A. Givens is buried. The thing that's interesting is even the late 1860s off by 10 years, they probably wrote the wrong number there. Instead of writing 30, accidentally wrote 20, but basically notice they all end in either a zero or a one for his age. And so 1830, seems to be more reasonable than the 1834. So that gives me reason to accept the 1830 year is the correct year of birth for this man. And why is this important? Because if there's any other John Givens is around, and there are, this helps to identify him correctly or more correctly so that we have a better chance to keep him from not being misidentified with some of these other guys. Now, the thing that got me interested is this source, which is a Confederate Civil War record. Remember, Missouri was in the South. Um, there was a John A. Givens in Missouri that served in the Civil War in the Cavalry and Infantry. And so I wanted to know, is this my guy? Because there's no dates, no, no actual places other than the word Missouri for this person. Is this my John A? There are other John A. Givenses in the world. So what can I do? Well, let's see if we can explore this and do it in a way that's maybe a little different that you might not have thought of. And this is something that can be very helpful to all of us. Notice it said he was in Company D of the 16th Missouri Infantry, Confederate Infantry. Let's just do a Google search. And sure enough, in Wikipedia, there is an article on the 16th Missouri Infantry Regiment. You know, the joke is that if you can't find it, it's in Wikipedia. Well, you know, be surprised how much is in Wikipedia. And in this extensive article, the part I was interested in is the different companies here. Because it said he was in Company A, a private in Company A of Winston's Missouri Infantry Regiment and in Company D of the 16th Missouri Infantry Regiment. Well, it turns out those are both the same infantry regiment. At one point, it was just called Winston's Missouri Infantry. And then later on, it got called the 16th Missouri Infantry. Well, this is a list of the four companies that made up this regiment and where they came from, the people and where they came from. 
And what's interesting is this regiment actually started in Arkansas. They couldn't find enough guys, so they moved into northern Missouri and started recruiting there. And John belonged to Company A, and they were in Johnson County recruiting people for Company A at one point. He was also in Company D, which was exclusively people from Johnson County. And so it really appears that this 16th Missouri Infantry Regiment came from the place where my John A. Givens lived. And so logic says that this is most likely my guy, and I can go ahead and attach Civil War records for John A. Givens from Missouri that belonged to this 16th Infantry Regiment, or later on when he became a junior second lieutenant from the 5th Division of the Missouri State Guard of the 1st Cavalry Regiment. So eventually he got a promotion. So I can go ahead and attach him, but this is the kind of thing you want to do. You don't want to just jump on things and say, John A. Givens, Missouri, this has got to be my guy. See if you can prove it. Okay. Well, the real thankful Marsh stepped forward. I know how this story started. I know where the problem is for this. And it's a very simple one, and it goes with what we've been talking about. The name Thankful Marsh. That's an uncommon name. When people found out that James Barney up here, my third great grand or fourth great grandfather, married Thankful Marsh, everybody jumped on a Thankful Marsh that was born in Massachusetts, where John Barney came from. There was only one Thankful Marsh in Massachusetts. So logically, she had to be his wife if he married Thankful Marsh. Now, unfortunately, there's no marriage record for them that's ever been found, but we do have birth records for both of them. And we know that this Thankful was born in, in Montague, Franklin County, Massachusetts, and supposedly around 1775 when she was 20 or so in Rehoboth, Massachusetts, according to the Barney family history, she married James Barney, who was from Rehoboth, which doesn't make sense because usually the woman marries in her hometown, not the husband's. But that's what the Barney book said. And the Barney book said that after they got married, they moved to Vermont. They moved west to Vermont to Wyndham County there, and that's where their first child was born in 1776, supposedly a year or so after they married. So that's the story from history. And this whole thing started for me when I said, okay, I really would like to try to find that marriage record. And that's when the whole story unraveled. Because there's a problem. Here's Thankful's birth record. She most definitely was born in Montague, Hampshire County, Massachusetts. And that agrees with everything we've ever known about her. The names of her parents agree with what we know. But then I was looking through newer records that have come out in the last hundred years. And I found a marriage record for her, but it wasn't to my Barney. She married a Samuel Dodge in Franklin County in 1797 when she was 40 years old or 39 years old, 40. And to make it even worse, she died in the county right next to Franklin County in 1824 is thankful Dodge. So she really did marry Mr. Dodge and stayed married to him. It'd be hard for her to be having Barney children a state over, two states over from there. So what was going on? 
Okay, who is it that married James Barney? Assuming her name was Thankful Marsh. I have to go with that because that's what the Barney book said back in the early 1900s. That the wife's name was Thankful Marsh. Well, this is what turns up. There was another Thankful Marsh in New England. She was down in Connecticut. And confusingly enough, Wyndham County, Connecticut not Wyndham County, Vermont. But this thankful Marsh was born just about the same exact year, just one year different than the, the thankful Marsh that was in Massachusetts. And her family moves to Vermont, to Wyndham County, Vermont. So from Wyndham County, Connecticut to Wyndham County, Vermont. And unfortunately, after all my work, there's still no marriage record for her. But it makes more sense that what happened was the Barneys moved to Vermont. My ancestor wasn't married yet. He meets this thankful Marsh in Wyndham County, Vermont, marries her, even though there's no record for it. But we know that the children all say children of James and thankful Barney. Uh, she marries them there and has the children. And so I then now have a whole new pedigree for her. And the fun part of the whole thing is, is that her uh, second great grandfather, his father was in the other Marsh pedigree for the other thankful Marsh. So these two thankful Marshes are about third or fourth cousins. And so it's kind of funny. They go back to the same ultimate pedigree. It's just that there's a whole different line in between. But those are the things you have to be careful for because a thankful Marsh is a very unusual name. I actually found one other one, but she was about 20 years younger. And so she couldn't have been the wife. But there's only three thankful Marshes in all of family search. Okay, census issues. Just recently, I was working on a George Callanan who married a Carolyn Wilson. And all I knew is what it shows here. Didn't have any dates on him, had a death year for her, had a marriage in Philadelphia and two children, Theodore and Virginia, born in Philadelphia. So censuses will fit this one pretty good. And I... I, the first thing that popped up when I did a search was the 1860 census. And they're in Philadelphia. They're in the first ward or 10th precinct. And the family is George D. Callahan, not Callahan, but Callahan, who works in a detective office. Remember, we said, look at occupations. He's got a wife, Caroline and a daughter, Virginia. So see, this family appears to be the family. We've got George now, and we have a birth year for him, which would be 56 years earlier, 1804. The wife is 52, so that'd be about 1808. And Virginia's 12, and that would be 1848, 1847. Seems to fit pretty good. So I said, okay, let's keep looking. Now, I'm excited. I'm really getting into this. And I just jump on the next census that I can find without thinking about being sequential. And I've missed over something that will come up here. So I find them in 1880, I think. I was having trouble finding them. But I was able to come up with this 1880 census, still in Philadelphia, living on 16th Street. No precinct ward in 1880. George Cal Callawan, they're having trouble reading it, 76, but I believe it's him. His age is good, and he works as a detective officer. See, this is where this occupation comes in really handy. But there's a, two other people in the home, a Susanna Dodd, who's listed as a daughter, but I don't have a Susanna here, and a Stanley Carthage, 18 grandson. So I have no idea where he came from. 
So I'm a little confused. I'm not sure what's going on. I tried to first trace down Susanna Dodd and I wasn't able to find her at first. But I did find Stanley and I found his death certificate and it did say that his mother's maiden name was Callahan. Callanan, that's close enough for me. So one of the children of George Callanan or Callahan is obviously Stanley's mother for real. So it sounds like that's good, but I'm not sure. And I was having trouble because as you go through time, less and less of the family lives with the person. And I was in so excited that I really forgot about probably the most important census, which would be the 1850. And for whatever reason, it did not pop up at first. And I had to dig around, even though it looks like when you see this, you're going to say, well, that should have just come right up. But it didn't. It, I did finally find him, 1850 census in Philadelphia in a South Mulberry ward. And George D., it says he was not working that year. His wife is Caroline. Then there's George. Here's a Susanna, Susanna Dodd. Here's Susanna, a Sarah, a Caroline, a Mary, and then Theodore in Virginia, Theodore in Virginia that were here. This has got to be our family. And then from this, I did some more research, and I was able to find that Susanna did, in fact, marry a Mr. Dodd. And Caroline, the one that is here, who's not found on any of the other censuses, she married a cartilage, which has got to be Stanley's father. And how it's spelled, I don't know, but these are the two spellings that I found. And so, you know, using relationships, using location, using, you know, jobs, all helped in putting this family together, even though the spellings changed and things like that, it was able to be pieced together. So it can be done. You just have to be careful. You got to work, you know, through things carefully and take notes before you put any of this in. I did all this research and the, the family still looked like it does on the left hand side until after I had done all this. And then I was satisfied that I had what I wanted. And then I went back to the censuses and started using source linker and linking them in, but only after I was satisfied that I really did have the right family over time. And then that way it avoids any issues that might pop up. Okay, I hope that this has helped you. I hope that you're able to... Uh, be a little more cautious and careful in the way you approach, especially problem people when you run into them in tree. And if you do, if you treat them the right way, you'll avoid a lot of those pitfalls that we don't want to have. Let me stop the recording.